All right, on page 28, we have uh, the composition of air. And you have to memorize that air is a mixture of gases, and you're going to need to know this like all the way through physical science. You'll see it again in biology. You'll see it again in chemistry. So you may as well just learn it, okay? And so air is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other. Aren't you glad? We don't have to know that one. Okay, so I want you to say it with me. We're going to say 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% other. You ready? 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% other. <clears throat> you have to know that. Make it a song, sing it to your dog, tell your little brother, whatever it takes. Yeah, because you really, you really need to have that memorized. <clears throat> now, we're looking, when we look at this, we're looking at air with no water in it whatsoever. Because this is how the air is throughout the first seven miles at least of the atmosphere. No matter where you took the sample from, it would be 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% other. Okay? So there'd be less air as you go up but it would still be this mixture. <laughs> and so this is important. You need to know this. And so we're taking the water out, and that is what it is. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was your age, I was taught we breathe in oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide. You've heard that before. But is that all we're breathing in? No. We breathe in mostly nitrogen. We don't breathe in mostly oxygen, and that's a good thing. From your reading, what would happen if we breathed in mostly oxygen? It'd kill you. It burns you up. Makes you go blind. Burns your lungs. Not good. I don't think those things are good. So it's very important that we're not breathing straight oxygen. Yes, Kiri? If that's the same amount of mixture for air anywhere in the world, then why is it clearer in, in some parts? And then the, because you've added pollution. There's pollution added. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, they've added pollution. This is actually what the air is without the pollution. That's a good question. Yeah, we're looking at before it's messed up. Yes, Clay? Uh, could, the fact, could the nitrogen and other earth chemicals neutri help neutralize the... I, we know that it helps neutralize the oxygen. Is that why... But is that why I ozone... But is ozone just oxygen left alone, but not touched by anything? No. We'll learn about ozone in the chapter about atmosphere. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's the next chapter. We'll do ozone in the next chapter, OK? OK. OK. All right, so here we're talking about regular oxygen, O2, two oxygens attached. Ozone, if you and I breathe it, is deadly. So it's in the atmosphere, but it's up high where it can't hurt us, but it does protect us. And that's O3, so it's two plus one hanging off. And that's totally different, OK? So that's not what we're talking about here. This oxygen is O2, which is what we have to breathe to survive. And the reason we have to breathe it to survive is this. Our cells actually have to burn glucose, which is healthy sugar, to make little batteries called ATPs to keep us alive. The reason we die if we don't breathe oxygen is because our body can't burn the little glucose molecules, the fuel, and can't make little batteries. And without the little batteries, without the ATPs, we die on a cellular level. That's why you die if you run out of oxygen. So far, so good? Because you can't burn glucose to make batteries called ATPs or recharge those batteries. OK. So with that in mind, as Clay was saying to us, uh, the oxygen we just said, because uh, why it helped too, um, if this was too high, it would burn us up. It causes us to go blind. It causes our bodies to burn too quickly. We read in the reading that if it went up uh, by even 
10% to 31%, we'd have 70% more forest fires, which means basically life couldn't exist as we know it on planet Earth if we had that situation, because everything would be way too combustible. So every time lightning struck, everything would just go on fire. And that would be really, really bad. So what God did was he diluted the oxygen. And he diluted the oxygen with nitrogen. And the reason he used nitrogen, does anybody remember why God chose nitrogen to dilute the oxygen with? Clay? Did it have something to do with the fact that we don't use nitrogen in our bodies? Even, yes, but there's other gases we don't use that would still poison us. But you're on the right track, Clay. You're on the right track. It's that it's an inert gas, and that is actually in your reading. And what inert means is that it doesn't react. It doesn't react at all. So I'm going to give you my version of what inert means. Inert is a couch potato. You know a person that no matter what you do, poke them, prod them, throw them off the couch, all they do is lay there and go, I'm not moving, man. Right? A couch potato. Nitrogen is a couch potato gas. Nitrogen doesn't react. So what happens when we breathe it in? It doesn't react with anything. It's a couch potato. It goes in, it goes out, it goes in, it goes out, but it just lays there. Do, do, do. Okay? So nitrogen is an inert gas. It's a couch potato gas. And so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, affect anything. Well, that's very important because <laughs> if it were many other gases that even though our body doesn't use, they would react with things and poison us, like carbon monoxide, like carbon dioxide if it's in high levels, etc. Okay, those would poison us. So God very carefully chose what he diluted the oxygen with so that it wouldn't cause us uh, disaster. On page 29, it tells us here that oxygen is what is needed in combustion, which is burning. Anytime you hear oxygen uh, combustion, think burning. We're told here that Stevie Wonder was blind because as a premature baby, they put him in um, straight too much oxygen for too long and it caused him to go blind. How many of you know who Stevie Wonder is? I just want to know. Very few. Okay, we all do because he's a little older than I am and he is one of the most talented musicians I think of our time. Um, he wrote beautiful songs and we all remember him on TV and he's blind so he's singing like this, you know? And he's got long hair and, you know, because he's got lots of money because he's very good at what he does. Have you ever heard the song, um, Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? That's Stevie Wonder. He did a lot of those kind of songs. Nice songs. Songs that you kind of, he wrote that about his little girl. You know what I'm saying? He wrote really pretty songs that we all know because he was on the radio. He's in music. He's in elevators. You know what I'm saying? Very, very talented. And he would always sing his songs while he was playing a grand piano blind. Just, you know, rocking. <laughs> He'd be rocking out. Isn't that what you remember when you think of Stevie Wonder? He'd just be going back and forth and singing. I never knew that his blindness was caused by a mistake in the hospital, which is so sad. But then God blessed him with the talent that he was able to use, you know. And so it might even have helped him with his talent. You just never know. So anyway, um, and then we already talked about that if you increase the percentage of oxygen, that it would increase the forest fires. So that would be very dangerous. Now we have this experience. Experiment, and I am going to do this one for you on page 30. So let's try to do this together without Mrs. Frady's burning her hands up. The reason I say that is because I used to do, I used to let the students do this experiment until I watched two of my students almost burn the room down. That's when I stopped letting the students do this experiment. I also had some students that burned themselves, and I thought, I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. First, We light our candle. I'm just going to use your cup here. There we go. Okay. Because it puts my thing out. And then I don't have to burn the place down. Can you see? How's that? Is that better? Okay. So we can everybody see the candle? So first, you tell me. What's going to happen when I close the candle in there? It's going to burn. Yep, it's going to burn and it's going to go out because it doesn't have, well, you tell me, why is it, does it go out? Because it doesn't have enough oxygen. Very good. Now this is 32 ounces, so we need about half of this. 
So let's see if I can do this without a total mess. This is hydrogen peroxide from the grocery store. Actually, it's from the CVS, but anyway. Okay. And then we're supposed to put in it, how much yeast does it say? Quickly add about one teaspoon of yeast without making too much of a mess. Well, well, I could also get a funnel, but does that look like about a teaspoon? Yeah. We're gonna, um, in the kitchen, <laughs> over, the, uh, s over the sink, if you open the cabinets, there's a big bowl. Would you bring me any big bowl? Because as soon as I shake this, we're going to have a mess. One. Yes, thank you. And our garbage can, it just hit me. And our garbage can's full, so I need a bowl. Any, any bowl. Any pot, any bowl. Anything. I should have thought of that before. I'm sorry. And I will go ahead while she's being so kind as to get that. I should have thought of that before. I had a bowl in here earlier, and then I took it back. I'm going to light our fire again. Okay, this has to be thrown away. Okay, what we're gonna do, can you see, can you guys see it's starting to erupt? I don't know if you can see that, and I'm scared to move it, but it's starting to lump up on one side, and I haven't even mixed it yet. It's going to have quite a reaction once I uh, stir it. And it just hit me, I've done this before, and then it flows all out of the bottle, and if I don't have something for it to flow into, we're gonna be in trouble, and that garbage can is full. So, Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, before I stir it, I'm going to put my balloon over it, praying that my balloon has no holes, because if it has a hole, I'm in trouble. Okay. Okay. Boy, that almost sounds like it's got a... Yeah, you see what I was talking about. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, let's try the experiment now. <laughs> watch, watch for me. Okay, you see what the fire looks like. Can everybody, wait a minute, can everybody see the fire? That's important. Can everybody see it? If not, stand up, get where you can see the little flame. Okay, because when I do this, it's only going to happen once. Can you see it? Rachel, come on over so you can see. Okay, okay, you ready? I'm going to let the air in there. Oh, no, I'm losing the flame because I'm, I'm running out of oxygen. Could you see how bright the flame got? Did everybody see how bright the flame got? Okay, that's what you were supposed to see, and now we're going to make it go out. Now you see why I needed the bowl. It didn't hit me until I did it, and I'm standing there going, uh-oh, because I, I know what this does. I've done it before. Okay, what did... Got it all over myself. What did we see there? We saw this, this produces oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide is actually H2O2. It's water with an extra oxygen attached to it. What the yeast does is the yeast breaks the extra oxygen off of the water. And that's why we could collect oxygen in our balloon that way. Oh, please don't go home and try that, though. You can burn the house down really easily. I can just see it on some of the what? guy's face. Yeah, please don't do that. And so it produces oxygen. And so I have seen students do that, get a whole balloon full of oxygen. And I've seen students let that go. And I've watched the flame literally run up their hand and blow up the balloon. And they they burnt themselves. Very dangerous. That's why I no longer ask students to do this experiment because I've seen people get burnt. If you let it go too fast, it won't just make the fire go lighter. It literally runs up the, the uh, oxygen into the balloon and then blows the balloon up. Not good, okay? Not good. Anyway, so what we saw with that experiment, and if you want to write that experiment up, it would count as extra credit, okay? But what we saw with that experiment is that combustion is increased by increased oxygen, isn't it? When we increased the oxygen level, the uh, fire actually burned hotter and brighter.
And so you can kind of see where if we have higher oxygen levels in our bodies, it causes our cells to burn higher and hotter, and that's not good. We burn out faster. And that's where it can cause lung damage and it can cause, um, you know, eye issues and stuff like that. Okay? Um, yeah, it smells kind of like bread now. Okay, so the speed at which a fire burns is directly related to the concentration of oxygen in its surroundings. So if you have higher oxygen in the surroundings, then the fire burns faster and it starts easier. And that's why, have you ever been in a hospital and it'll say no flame, oxygen in the area? Okay, and they'll actually have signs like that in the hospital because even a spark will just light the place up. And it's killed some astronauts before. But before they knew any better, they actually, and I can't remember which Apollo it was, but one of the Apollos, one of them, Gemini, one of them, they had a complete 100% oxygen atmosphere. And there was a spark, and the whole thing went up. And they lost all the guys in it. Plus, they didn't know they were killing them anyway by putting them in 100% oxygen. They just didn't know. And so after that, they started to dilute the oxygen just so that it wasn't so combustible. Because one spark, and you're done if you've got a high oxygen content. Yes, Amanda. My mom used to work with somebody that got lung cancer, so he was um, on an oxygen tube. Uh -huh. And he still smoked, and then it blew up. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, you can't have a flame around oxygen. That's just asking to blow up. That's not the way I'd want to go. Oh, we won't go there. Okay, uh, let's see. You can't, you can't stop people frequently once they've got that habit, uh, that addiction. I've known a lot of people that died of lung cancer that were still smoking when they died because they figure, why quit at that point? So... You don't realize, though, that God is a God of second chances. You always want to go for the chance, you know? I would. So, anyway, I mean, I would have been one of those people that if I was on the Titanic, I wouldn't have gone down with the ship. I'd have been in taking doors apart and throwing doors in the water. Tables, whatever. I'd have been finding things that float and been throwing them in the water. I wouldn't have been going down singing nice songs. I'm just a terrible person. I'd have gone for it, you know? Sorry, that's just how I think. You have to forgive me. Okay, um... Okay, so the oxygen is diluted, and we already talked about that, and so it's very, very important it's diluted. Now, let's turn over to page 32, please. Okay, on page 32, it says, if a scientist were to measure the percentage of nitrogen and oxygen in a sample of air that was not dry, what would they be greater or less than or essentially the same as the percentages shown in figure 2.1? This is a very confusing question for some people. And the, I think the best way to explain this is this. Okay, it says if we have a sample of regular air, let's just say we have a sample of dry air and we said it's 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% other. Let's say that's our thing, right? 78, 21, <coughs> One, right? If we added water to that, our percentages all have to shift, don't they? Because now there's less of the pie here, less of the pie here, less of the pie here. So let's go back to the question. And the question says, if a scientist were to measure the percentages of these things in a sample of air that was not dry, would they be greater or less than the original uh, percentages? They'd be less than because you've added another piece, so everything would have to go down, wouldn't it? Does everybody see that? So if you have to draw a picture for you to answer some of these questions, feel free, because I would. Okay? I would draw myself a picture to make sure I was right. At high altitudes, there is less air around you as compared to lower altitudes. Would a candle at high altitudes burn dimmer, brighter, or the same? Dimmer. Dimmer, because there's less um, oxygen. Very good. Now, the next section on carbon dioxide is very important. There's two main reasons why carbon dioxide is absolutely essential to life on planet Earth. Somebody give me what's one reason we have to have carbon dioxide or everything would die. What's wrong? Yes, Clay. Um, the, um, plants breathe Very dioxide. good. Thank you, Clay. Plants. Very good. We're running out of time. That's why I'm speeding up. Very good. Plants. Plants use carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis, to make sugars. It's absolutely essential to life on planet Earth. Plants need carbon dioxide. The other one, does anybody remember what the other one is? It's, it's the greenhouse effect. Remember that? The greenhouse effect. 
And some of you have heard that that's a bad thing, but we would die without the greenhouse effect. Global warming, which is too much of a greenhouse effect, is a bad thing, uh, which I don't think is actually happening. But um, the greenhouse effect itself is not a bad thing. Look on page 33. If you have the sunlight coming into the planet and it's allowed to just bounce completely back off without getting caught, our planet would be very cold. I don't know if you realize this, but the moon is basically the same distance from the sun we are. But if you stand on the moon, the part towards the sun will be 200 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the part away from the sun. Yeah, weird, right? It's because there's no atmosphere to do this greenhouse thing. The greenhouse gases catch the atmosphere and keep it bouncing in the atmosphere, a more of it, and give us a very nice average temperature of the planet at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, including Antarctica, the Arctic, and the equator. If you average it all out, because of the greenhouse gases, it's at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is good. And so CO2, like water vapor, is a greenhouse gas. So it's got a very important job, which is to keep the planet warm and to uh, allow the plants to go through photosynthesis. So CO2 is very, very important. Now, does anybody here remember what causes CO2? What, where do we get it? Anything burning makes CO2. So when we turn on a light, we're making CO2. When we breathe, we're making CO2. When we use any kind of energy or burn anything, we're making CO2. I just want you to understand that. So the, the CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing because there's more people and we're doing more burning. But that doesn't seem to directly correlate with global warming. I want you to know that. And we won't talk about global warming till next week. But look on page 35 because this one's really important to me. I never could understand how CPR worked. You guys know what I mean by CPR, where if somebody has a heart attack, you get in there and you blow in their face and you pump their heart, you know, to keep them alive. I never could understand how that would work because if we're breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide, how is me blowing into that person helping them at all? Look at figure 2.5. On the left side, you have inhale there. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% other. Look at the other side. On the other side, you have exhale there. Look at the percentage of oxygen and exhale there. It's still 16%, which means if I'm blowing into that person, they're still getting a whole bunch of oxygen, so it really can keep them alive. Wow! I never understood how CPR worked, and when I saw this, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's why it works. So that was cool. Anyway, if you ever wondered, there's the answer. I like the practical stuff. I'll tell you what, we are going to come back and finish this up next week because we have to clean up. Have a Jesus-filled week. <laughs>